Okay, this is the beginning of the seminar on the Kabbalistic words of Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas. Part of uh, the work that I do in recovering the, the teachings of Yeshua, but this is teachings that are the inner circle teachings given to his apostles and disciples that uh, are very hard to capture. Uh, and I've asked people to prepare for this by watching my YouTube presentation introducing the, uh, the, where the, what the Gospel of Thomas is and where it came from, so I, I'll, I'll go over that material rather quickly just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, we're going to begin with an introduction and then go line by line through the Coptic text. And we'll use word equivalencies, that is Greek words that commonly were used to translate Aramaic words to recover the original Aramaic meanings. This is my methodology. It's not difficult to do. Uh, the Coptic version was translated from an earlier Greek version. And we know the general equivalencies between Greek and Aramaic, so we get back to the Greek through the Coptic, and then from the Greek we can go back to, uh, to the original Aramaic. And much of Coptic is made up of Greek loan words, just like we have words like cigarette, which are French, but we use them as regular words. So an awful lot of words in, in, in Coptic are Greek words that are just put in the Coptic alphabet. And for each login, we'll look at the Coptic text, we'll identify the key terms and comment on them, and then we'll offer the best translation and we'll paraphrase it to help you understand the meaning. And this is very often a very extensive process. I've worked on this all winter. And uh, I'm going to use some of my YouTube parts of some of my YouTube or other presentations on uh, concepts associated with the original teachings of Yeshua to illuminate certain things. So you'll, you'll see sometimes in this information. Uh, you have a take-home bound booklet uh, with all the Logian slides. There's just slides of the Logian, not the whole presentation. Um, this covers maybe 5 or 10 percent. I think maybe it's more than 5 percent, maybe about 10 percent of what's in the book. And uh, the book is available online or in hard copy. And if you pre-ordered this, you can purchase it for $25 today. If not, but you want to buy the book, the price is $35. And you can order it online for $35 plus shipping. It's actually $36. And you can purchase it, it as an e-book for $20, but you have to print it out or read it on your computer. So let's start with, what was the Kabbalah? What do I mean by Kabbalah? Well, the word Kabbalah actually was a term that was not used in, in Talmudic Judaism until about the 8th century of the common era. When I say CE, it doesn't mean Christian era, it means common era, it means the same thing as AD. And before the common era was BCE, and we use this terminology, uh, most scholars use that rather than AD and BC. But the Kabbalah is from the Aramaic, and the Aramaic is Chaldean. It's basically, there was a huge, uh, there may be about two million people in Palestine who were Jews, but there were about uh, four or five million people outside of Palestine in the diaspora, and the largest and most advanced and the most sophisticated Jewish community was in Babylon. And that's where Yeshua shows all of his relationships when he's constantly talking about the Son of Man. That's a particular Messiah that's very different than the other ones that were talked about in Palestine. And he has a lot of other Kabbalistic connections to Babylon the Babylonian community. That's why in my book I have him in his lost years in Babylon. Uh, anyway, Kabbalah means to take or receive. It's the word Kabbal is also what we refer to as a group where teaching goes on. On, on days like it is today, a Shabbat, a Saturday, Jewish men would sit around and study Torah, scripture. And uh, if they were studying the mystical aspects of Torah, they were using Torah to understand uh, the deep mysteries of the universe and so on, then that was called a cabal, a small group that was giving Kabbalistic instruction. <coughs> so the interpretation of the inner meaning of Hebrew scripture was done by a rav. This is before we had rabbis or a rav. Uh, a rav simply means a great one or a master of Israel. Uh, Yeshua was called a, a master of Israel. 
Uh, and that was what was called secret knowledge. And the word would not be gnosis, that's a Greek word. The word is manda. It's secret knowledge that was given and received orally and in private. And it was going on for about at least 300 years before the time of Yeshua and continues today. And because Kabbalah is uh, cumulative, it's not like it, it comes and goes or so, it's some Kabbalah applies to one century and a different Kabbalah to a later century. While it does grow and things are added to it, very little is lost from it. So we can go back through Kabbalistic traditions and we can see the evidence of uh, 16th century Kabbalah in 9th century Kabbalah and all the way back. <coughs> Uh, there were some 1st and 2nd century Jewish Kabbalistic masters that were contemporary with Yeshua. Uh, Hillel of Babylon. Uh, Yeshua knew his teaching. He, in fact, even uh, paraphrases it. Um, Yohanan ben Zakkai, who was the founder of Rabbinic Judaism. We'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, that's the only picture we have. They have up at the Knesset, I think, in, in Jerusalem. is just a carved thing. None of these are real photographs or anything. These are just, you know, graphics. <coughs> uh, uh, Akiba, who was a saint and martyr and a student of Ben Zakkai, they were all great Kabbalistic uh, teachers and interpreters. And Philo of Alexandria, who was a Jew of the Diaspora, prolific Jewish mystic, whose writings, he lived from about 30 uh, years before the Common Era to about maybe 20 or 30 years afterwards, and he was a contemporary of Yeshua. And many of the Kabbalistic sayings in the Gospel of Thomas, we can find illumination on them, like the five trees in paradise and so on from reading Philo. Uh, there are written sources that contain Kabbalistic knowledge from first and second century Judaism. The most important is the Sefer Yitzira, um, which uh, you all know, I, I think I suggest usually Arya Kaplan's translation. And uh, Sefer Haradzim, <coughs> which I've translated and I have uh, available privately for people. The Hekalot literature, which, is, uh, which was, was preserved in Talmudic tradition. And uh, uh, that's, that's still here and still available. The Hekalot are the, the sanctuaries or the, uh, uh, the holy places around the throne of God. And the Haggadah, this preserved in the Mishnah, Babylonian and Palestinian, Palestinian Talmud, the Babylonian being the really oldest and the most uh, sophisticated, and a whole literature of intertestamental period known loosely as the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha of the Old Testament. These were the holy scriptures of the Essenes. That was before there was a Bible. The Bible was first put together in AD 70 by uh, the Jewish uh, uh, people who survived the siege of Jerusalem under uh, uh, Ben Zakkai. Probably, it seems to be when it was done, and it was decided what was going to be in the scripture of what we call the Old Testament and what was not going to be. And the, la the, la the latest or last book that was included was the book of Daniel, which is very important to Messianic Judaism, uh, but not things that were more recent scriptures. They, they said the Holy, scripture, the Holy Spirit left Israel after that point, and nothing after that was written was inspired. And that was because the Christians were using it, the Messianic Jews. And of course, the Christians uh, quickly dropped a lot of the literature that was part of their original Bible <coughs> because it was too Jewish. It was part of the, the Jewish literature and so on. That was the intertestamental. But these were, in fact, the holy scriptures of not just the Essenes, but the Zadokites and other Messianic Jews, including Yeshua and his disciples. The Psalms they chanted in worship and the Shabbat Seder were not just those that we know of in the Old Testament, the Psalms of David as they're called, but the Messianic Psalms of Solomon and many other things that we're not familiar with today. And they're preserved in the Enochian, that is the, the literature ascribed to the, the great uh, Jewish legendary Enoch and various apocalyptic forms of apocaly apocalyptic literature. So there's a whole source for all this stuff. If you know this stuff, you can understand what Yeshu was talking about. Uh, Kabbalah was transmitted orally, but was sometimes recorded in secret documents that were transmitted. But they were not transmitted like the Holy Scriptures. The Jewish way of transmitting the Old Testament Scriptures 
was uh, a group of people would sit down and a master would, would recite it and they would all write down what he said or what they thought he said. And whenever they came to the name of God, which you see in the King James Version as capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's, that's Yahweh, that's the Tetragrammaton, they'd get up and wash their hands. And um, whenever you see capital L, small o, r, d, that just is Adonai, which is, means master of the universe, but it's not the name of God, which is holy. And uh, so they transmitted things very accurately. We can find texts of the Old Testament, Jewish texts from the second century, or the, Samarit the Samaritan copies from two centuries B.C., and they're almost exactly uh, letter for letter what we have today, because they were transmitted so faithfully. Oh. And every time there was a, um, every time there was any kind of an error, that that scribe's thing was destroyed, and it was kept. And out of a group of maybe ten scribes, you would get one or two really good copies because there were errors of sight and hearing and so on. But that didn't happen with the Kabbalistic literature, with, for example, the Sefer Haaretzim, or, or the, I mean, rather the uh, uh, Sefer Yetzirah. Uh, that was transmitted. It was written down very early. It was written down in the, about the first or second century of the Common Era. But uh, after having been a tradition for maybe uh, 300 years and added to and so on, it was very influenced by Pythagorean uh, Kabbalistic ideas, which were based on letter number mysticism. And the whole business of the, the tree, uh, the, the ten sephiroth and so on, is related to and depended upon a lot of Pythagorean Greek ideas because in the diaspora the Jews, people of different religions, uh, discussed their religions with each other, especially at the highest levels, and that happened in Babylon. That's why the Old Testament that we have, the book of Genesis, which is written by the priests in Babylon, tells the same story as the, as the Babylonian creation story, which was 2,000 years earlier, and many other things, the whole idea of angels and demons and things comes in then uh, because of that relationship. So there's a lot of syncretism in this. And uh, so uh, Jewish Kabbalah drew from many sources besides itself. It was inspired by things that it meant, just like we do today. We go to other kinds of religions and we take the best and we incorporate them into our own things and so on. That, that's a process that's been going on a long time, especially in the Hellenistic period. But uh, Sefer Haratzim, uh, rather, uh, Sefer Yitzira, uh came down uh, in written versions that were secret versions, but they weren't copied in the same kind of way with the same kind of strictness. And so we had <coughs> longer and shorter versions with it. And that was true of the New Testament. For example, the book of Luke, the Gospel of, the Gospel of Luke, and the book of Acts, which is one long epistle to a fellow named Theophilus, uh, in its earliest textual versions is half as long as it was by the time of the Byzantine Empire. And, and text, so textual criticism is very important in, in Christianity to recover the earliest versions because people got creative with the texts and they added to it, even though they weren't supposed to. In fact, that was going on even as late as Erasmus in the, uh, <coughs> in the Counter-Reformation, who we know exactly who it was he who added a certain line to a certain thing in, a, in an epistle of John and so on. So, uh, so we have to, textual criticism is quite a big deal in Christianity to get back to recover the earliest forms. Uh, it's not in Judaism because they, they kept it that way, they kept it clean, but they didn't do that with the Kabbalistic writings. Uh, they went through different schools and there were pogroms and there were separate communities. And so they were later consolidated uh, the magical writings like Sefer Haaretzim, which were, we find collected in the Cairo Ganitza, uh, were not transmitted even as a book, just as separate fragments. Uh, so <clears throat> most often, Kabbalistic fragments and allusions and psalms are found embedded in the wisdom literature, the whole the wisdom schools of uh, first, second century before the Common Era Judaism and so on, like the wisdom of Jesus Ben Sirach. Um, and the Apocalypse of Moses and Baruch and so on. Um, and it was at this point that Merkaba mysticism had been developing for some time and it finally becomes 
things become written down about it, we read it out in the Mishnah about <coughs> certain rabbis that did ascend to the throne of God, etc. Uh, and what happened to them, some of them went insane and this and that. But, um, and uh, the, uh, 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 The, the Merkaba tradition eventually developed a literary tradition called the Hekalof uh, 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 writings, which are second and third century, but they still preserve a lot for us. Um, Pre-Christian traditions of Kabbalah remain embedded in modern Kabbalistic schools because Kabbalah is conservative. It doesn't... Uh, it doesn't whack away. It doesn't. Re it doesn't remove anything. It just keeps adding things to it. Uh, in the sixth to tenth period, which is called the Gaonic period, uh, Kabbalah taught was, was taught only in small secret Jewish societies in Babylon and Palestine, and the Babylonian was older and more respected, and they were little. That's where we get the term a cabal. In the twelfth century, Moses Maimonides rendered the opinion that all Jews should avoid any appearance of using magic astrology, alchemy, and Kabbalah, for which, by the way, they were very uh, highly respected in the Hellenistic world. They were hired as exorcists and magicians to do things and all that because of the uh, Gentile accusations against Jews of being sorcerers and things like this, uh, Christian things. Uh, so they were looking for reasons to accuse them of witchcraft and already uh, pogroms by mostly uh, uh, ignorant villagers whipped up by priests and people like that, sort of like the people do today against Barack Obama in the Catholic Church. Uh, they don't want to take responsibility for the fact that these ignorant people go out and then try to kill people and do things like that because they think they're pleasing God because the priests tell them so, you know. But anyway, that was happening, and Jews were being attacked, and their villages burned down, and, and men were killed, and a lot of Jewish men died at that time. And, and matter of fact, until that time, the lineage in Jewish families was traced through the males, the men. It was patriarchal. At that time, it had to become matriarchal. There weren't enough men. So today, if you're Jewish, it's because your mother was Jewish, not because your father is Jewish. If you have a Jewish father and a non-Jewish mother, you're not Jewish. Uh, so from this time on, esoteric studies were considered to be too dangerous by Orthodox Judaism, and Kabbalistic traditions were maintained only in specific Jewish cities and communities like Safed and so on. Today, normative uh, synagogue Judaism does not promote Kabbalah, and mainstream Jewish scholarship continues to deny that occult and Kabbalistic sciences were ever a part of Judaism. In fact, they were. They were quite a big part. Uh, the term Kabbalah, as I said, was first used by Jewish uh, Spanish mystics in the ninth century, probably also by Germans. Uh, <clears throat> the expulsion of the Jews from Spain in the 15th century produced Messianic revivals. And finally in the 16th century, Isaac Luria, who is known as the Ari, uh, uh, promoted a massive Messianic and Kabbalistic uh, revival in Safed. And... Uh, and produced the Zohar, which became the, the textbook of uh, Kabbalah. The, here's the original frontispiece from the first edition. And that was at the time, of course, 16th century, when books started to be published and became uh, available, printing. 18th to the 21st century scholarly uh, period gave a, a recovery in Jewish and, and mostly Christian scholarship of intertestamental <coughs> and contemporary non-canonical scripture of the Old New Testaments, and in surviving old Slavonic and Ethiopic and other forms, as well as Qumran, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and things like that. And we were finally able to find these ancient manuscripts and see what was going on. And today, uh, there is still a surviving secret Kabbalistic tradition in Jerusalem. This is Israel's leading known Kabbalist, because it's usually a secret and private thing. His name is Yitzhak Kaduri. Uh, he doesn't come out public very often. Uh, 
Um, the Jewish written Kabbalah then that, that became available in the form of the Zohar and so on was studied by European Christian Rosicrucians and Freemasons and other occultists and became known as the Christian Kabbalah and we spell it with a C sometimes with a Q and then at, at uh, about a little bit after that the ten be best textual versions of the ancient Sefer Yitzira were compared by uh, by uh, Kabbalists of the Safed school in the 1600s who chose the one that seemed most similar to what their received oral tradition was and a generation later the Ari <coughs> made changes to it and published it as the Ari version which was in agreement of course with his Zohar <laughs> that he had dictated and the final and best textual edition was edit edited by the Gra. He was Rabbi Eliyahu, the Gaon of Vilna in the 18th century. It's known as the Gra Ari version or something, the Gra version, and it's used by most Kabbalists today. And I recommend Ari Kaplan's exposition of this because if you really want to learn about Kabbalah, it goes all the way back to the time of Yeshua. There's, there it is. In the late 19th century, there was a great Kabbalist uh, named Rabbi Theon. He was a Polish Jew who settled in Algeria. And he was the Kabbalah teacher of Madame Blavatsky and of Mira Alfasa, who was the consort and, and, and soulmate of Sri Aurobindo, and outlived him by many years, whom his teachings influenced. In, Aurobindo was influenced very much by the teachings of uh, Rabbi Theon. So Max Theon had spent time in India and knew the Vedas and Sanskrit, and he dictated his teachings to his student Louis Thimonlis, whose son Pascal preserved them. <coughs> uh, they were then translated into English in 1983 and privately published by R.E.A. Rottenberg, who owns a small bookstore in Jerusalem. And I had a student who uh, wandered around the world quite a bit, a Jewish fellow who was sort of, a, you know, the, the Jew in the Lotus type of guy. He was really into Hindu stuff and everything. And he uh, tracked this down for me and uh, got me the address, and I wrote to R.E.A. Uh, Rottenberg and asked him for a copy of the book that was translated to English. It was entitled A Way of Meditation in the Light of the Kabbalah. And I have it and I give it to advanced students who are interested in what the real Kabbalah was. Most people think it's just uh, <coughs> a bunch of diagrams about trees and things. Yeah? The, the, the first day that you, when you stated they first suppressed, began to suppress the, the Kabbalah and didn't want to, didn't want to Esoteric stuff spoken about was what they, I mean, That was the time of Moses Maimonides, which is at the very, uh, probably, I, I, I've forgotten his exact date, but I think in the 1100s or 1200s, that sort of a period. <coughs> yeah. Is Rabbi Theon the same as Max Theon? Yes, yes. <laughs> so his Kabbalah was very different than that of what we think of as Kabbalah today or what they teach in Hollywood to mo movie stars and different than the Lurianic tradition, it was focused on soul evolution and psychic life and individual and group meditation, what happens after death and stuff like that. And it seems to have preserved ancient pre-Lurianic Kabbalah and syncretized it somewhat with Hindu mysticism, but it's not, it's, it's all pretty much Jewish. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's <coughs> not anything I've used uh, for understanding Kabbalistic teachings of Yeshua. I use the ancient literature, but it's interesting for people to know that it's that we can have access to things like that. So we want to understand the advanced inner circle teachings of Yeshua that are rooted in these Kabbalistic and Messianic traditions in Judaism. And we'll find some concepts that are not reflected in Christianity and church tradition. Self-liberation, in fact the name of Yeshua means liberation. It doesn't mean salvation, as some people have said. It's a word that means coming from a place that's narrow and cramped and dangerous because you could be ambushed into a wide plain and land of milk and honey. That's what Yeshua is. It's uh, liberation from things. Non-attachment. <coughs> Koheleth, one of the mystery, one of the wisdom school teachers who wrote what we call the uh, Ecclesiastes, which is in our Christian our Bible, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, has a lot of teachings about non-attachment that are part of the wisdom school traditions that you don't get in Christianity. Christianity doesn't talk about 
Maya and illusion and all that kind of stuff, but they very much did in Kabbalah. Spiritual debt was very much like what we think of as karma. It was not. It was very different than sin, the concept of sin. Uh, spiritual perfection was what the the the, uh, the 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 enterprise was all about, and that was done through halakha. The halakha was the wa the way or the path that a great rav or master of Israel would teach. It was your practices. It's what you practice. <coughs> Liberation came through practice, not through believing in something, not through a creed. It came through actually doing it and what you did in your life. Uh, when the, when the Barinash, when the Son of Man comes in his glory, uh, he will put some people on the right hand and some on the left, like a shepherd separates the sheep and his goats. And uh, what is the criterion by which he, he uses? It's what did they do? Not what did they believe, not anything else. That's what did they do. And that was a Kabbalistic idea. What you do in life is determines how your soul is built and what's real. Uh, union with the divine. Um, it's, uh, the term is Malkuth sovereignty. The idea of the sovereignty or the Malkuth of God is uh, goes way behind before the time of Yeshua. You'll find it used very much. It's a translator usually as sovereignty. <coughs> but it, uh, I'll talk more about what that means. And Merkaba, <coughs> throne mysticism, and Shaka, practices of uh, meditation that promote spiritual perfection and divine union in the flesh, on the earth. It's not something that's just pie in the sky. It's something you experience on earth. These are concepts. They, uh, they, were, uh, they were followed out mostly in Christian monastic traditions. And it's similar to later, later teachings and practices of the Kabbalah and also the Hermetica and, the, and, and Greek philosophers and Buddhism. So there's a lot of very interesting things that are related there. We're going to analyze the Coptic text to get the, recover the oldest Greek text, because remember, it was translated from Greek. And uh, we have Coptic loanwords, and we have a Greek version of the Coptic Gospel of Thomas called the Oxyrhynchus Papyri. And we have some parallels in the New Testament and things that help us with that. Nice thing about Crumb's Coptic Dictionary is that it helps, it gives us Greek, er, Greek Coptic equivalents. And then we use these to recover the orally transmitted spoken Aramaic words and concept used by Yeshua and his disciples. And we have some nice uh, 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 things that help us like the Abbot Smith and the Bauer and the lexicon that show Greek Hebrew things. Uh, the uh, there are various Old Testament lexicons for Hebrew Aramaic words and so on that, that show what the equivalencies were in trans translation. Because at that time, uh, the majority of Jewish people were Greek speaking. They were not in Palestine. They were in Babylon. Or the, and those in Babylon still spoke Chaldean. They spoke Aramaic. But in Alexandria and Rome and all the other places, they spoke Greek. And so in this, uh, the second century before the Common Era, the old the Jewish sacred scriptures, and which included a lot more than in what we, are, we call our Old Testament, included a lot of the uh, intertestamental literature, was translated for synagogues into Greek. It's called the Septuagint. The legend was that there were 70 uh, wise uh, Jewish sages who were each put in a separate room and, and given the stuff to translate into Greek. And lo and behold, when they were all done, every single one of them had translated exactly the same way. So it was the real thing. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit and all that sort of thing. So, <clears throat> so the Septuagint shows us very exactly what people how pe people translated Hebrew into Greek, and Hebrew is Aramaic. So we have a lot of help with that. Um, so we're going to translate and interpret each of the sayings line by line. We can compare Buddhist Dharma and Jewish Halakha. Uh, by the way, Maha, Mahayana Buddhism emerges at the time of early Christianity. It's contemporary with Yeshua. There was uh, uh, Ashoka had written his precepts on rocks uh, over in the east, uh, accessible on the Silk Road uh, from Babylon into, uh, into deeper into the east and so on. And Buddhists had come, they were called the gymnosophists, the naked philosophers. They had come to the Egyptian desert and established monasteries. 
uh, there was definitely communication going on. Uh, Dharma means divine spiritual law or a societal and cosmic duty and practice. It means a lot of different things. Um, and Buddhist masters taught spiritual concepts and practices around Dharma. And extended Dharmic practices were formalized later as complete paths to enlightenment, like the Tibetan Lam Rim, or ritualized as Buddhist tantras and transmitted only to advanced disciples. Uh, and initiatic permissions were given so that people could do these practices. They were empowerments, they were granted for advanced disciples to, uh, to practice these advanced forms of Dharma practice. Halakha was the Hellenistic Jewish mysticism that uh, informed Yeshua that in his own tongue. It means a way of walking or following divine spiritual law or the way of God. It's very much like Dharma. Uh, the spiritual concepts and practices were taught by a Hellenistic Jewish master uh, who was known as Mar, that's what we call him Mar Yeshua, to his disciples who were Talmudim. And his inst invitation to his disciples is Halkani, which means follow me, follow my halakha. Uh, Kabbalistic private teachings were transmitted orally like the uh, like the the Dharma teachings, uh, more advanced ones, there were secret interpretations of Torah and the writings and the Haggadah, the Messianic legends, and there was inner circle halakha that was given to advanced disciples of a Jewish Mar, which would, could have been Hillel, could have been Ben Zakkai, whoever. They included Kabbalistic Ratzim. Ratzim means uh, mysteries or secrets, hidden things of heaven in the wisdom schools. Merkaba mysticism, which was the mystery of interior ascent to the chariot throne of God in imitation of what Enoch and Elijah and uh, 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 Ezekiel and, and, and the great prophets had done, was being practiced secretly. And initiatic permissions were granted for advanced disciples to practice these things. Kabbalistic Jewish halakhic teachings and transmissions were comparable to Buddhist tantras or extended advanced yogas or unions authorized by Buddhist masters. So there's a lot of interesting comparison. And that's what we find reflected in the Gospel of Thomas, but in Jewish terms. We find Jewish Kabbalistic inner circle teachings and mysteries. And when we get there, we'll show you how that is. Um, so we have to separate in our minds a davar of Yeshua and a logian that you find in the Gospel of Thomas. The, here, the Hebrew Aramaic term davar means a word. A prophet delivered the word of God, and the davar can be translated as the thing of God. It could be, uh, it could be acted out, it could be spoken, it could be a lecture, it could be a prophecy, but it was uh, called the Davar, the thing of God. It wasn't a lecture. It wasn't uh, like that. It was mysterious and dynamic. It could be compared to a seed that had to be germinated or unfolded uh, or ripened. Uh, Davarim, which is the plural, might have the force of divine law. For example, the book of Deuter Deuteronomy is called Devarim, which is another way of saying Devarim. Uh, it can mandate new requirements for mitzvah or, or mitzvah or or works, uh, sacred works for God. It could admonish unfaithfulness to the ways of God or transmit the, the rot seams of heaven, including foreknowledge of the future. But a devar was always in the form of, div of a divine prophetic revelation from the throne of God. In other words, a prophet who had been there brought that message to you. That's what a devar was. And that's what these sayings of Yeshua are. They are devarim. But a Greek logian was a saying of a wise, wise teacher or philosopher. It might be a dark saying, like one of the cryptic verses attributed to Heraclitus regarding his Pantare oracle, which describes the impermanence of all phenomena, literally says, on those stepping into rivers, the same other and other waters flow. Now, he, his disciples would have understood that, but uh, it has to be paraphrased for us to understand it. 
it was directed to his own disciples in a philosophical school, and it was a thing that they memorized very often. It demanded keen understanding and interpretation, interpretation and the best way is to understand it with a, a paraphrase like, one cannot step into the same river twice, as the waters are always flowing. So that was his way of describing the impermanence of things and the change, the, the constant change that we see. Uh, but that would be a logian. Now, there were also logia that might be aphoristic and, and very easy to understand, like uh, from the golden verses attributed to Pythagoras, never suffer sleep to close thy eyelids after thy going to bed until thou hast examined by thy reason all thy actions of the day. Where have you heard about that? Wherein have I done amiss? What have I done? What have I omitted? I ought to have done. And in this examination thou find that thou hast done amiss. Reprimand thyself severely for it. But if thou hast done any good, rejoice. Or tie a little knot in your thread. <laughs> if you're doing THG. And uh, it's like Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. So th that's what a Logian is. The core sayings preserved in Thomas were not Logia. They were Devarim concerning the Ratzim or mysteries of heaven re revealed by Marma Yeshua to his closest circles of disciples. But they were understood by the people who transmitted it in Greek as Logia, philosophical <coughs> Logia, Gnostic Logia. So why were they presented this way? Well, after Yeshua's revelations were dictated from memory by a disciple, probably somewhere between the years A.D. or C.E. 30 and 50, and recorded as a written text in Greek, they assumed the literary form of Logia. That's what the New Testament is made out of. The, all the sayings of Jesus and parables of Jesus are parabolae. Their logia and parabolae, but originally they were devarim and mashlim, which are very different things. And as the text of this secret collection, now in Greek, was copied and circulated among Gentile Christian churches and eventually became uh, the property of the Syrian monks, the Thomasian monks who wrote this, the devarim were understood as dark sayings, like those of Heraclitus. They could lead you into the mysteries of heaven. They could initiate you, just the words themselves. Uh, they were not understood, so many of them were in interpreted anachronistically to reflect current church issues like the New Testament does. That's where the anti-Semitism of the New Testament comes, blaming the Jews for the killing of Jesus and the, they're losing their covenant and all this kind of stuff because they rejected their Messiah and all this sort of thing. Uh, this is... Uh, a lot of the sayings of Jesus were misunderstood and framed in that way in the New Testament. Um, that's why Clement of Alexandria wrote, Thus he, Mark, in his secret gospel, which we're going to look at, brought in certain sayings of which he knew the interpretation would, as a mystagogue, lead the hearers into the innermost sanctuary of truth hidden by seven veils. We'll talk about what those seven veils are later. Um, an initiate of the mystery religions uh, who assumed the powers of Egyptian Thoth or Greek Hermes to lead an initiate through the process of initiation was called a mystagogue. And so these words are giving you that same function. In the early church, a bishop gave a mystagogical homily to catechumens uh, who had studied for years before they would be initiated, and their understanding of initiation was baptism. And for some people, baptism was, was uh, put off until the end of their life so they wouldn't violate their baptism like uh, 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 Emperor uh, Constantine waited until he was dying to be baptized because it was understood. But for Yeshua, baptism was not a, the initiatic uh, thing. Baptism was a preparation, it was a cleansing. Uh, a lodge master, appointed master of the Freemasons, often delivers a special lecture with the same kind of function during the raising of a master mason. In the Alexandrian and Thomas traditions, the risen Christ was considered to live and operate as a mystagogue through a correct hearing or understanding or in Thomas reading of the initiatic words of Jesus. This is probably the intent of the Corpus Hermeticum. My old uh, teacher from Harvard used to call the Corpus Hermeticum a reading mystery. It was to bring you, to initiate you by reading it and understanding it. That's what uh, the... Uh, 
the Agni Yoga books are intended to be. They have to be read three different times on three different occasions before you get it because they're all given in dark sayings and so on. So the prologue to Thomas says, whoever discovers the meaning of these logia will not taste death. And that's how they're assembled and how they're understood. Uh, now Morton Smith, uh, who uh, discovered the secret gospel of Mark as a palimpsest in an, a monastery uh, 20, 30 years ago, uh, gave us this wonderful text from Clement of Alexandria, which uh, most scholars don't, uh, and, and the, whose, whose salaries are paid for by fundamentalist churches, and they don't want to know anything about this stuff, they don't want to hear about it. Uh, a lot of them don't like it, but really good scholars uh, say it's authentic, and I agree with them. Uh, Helmut Kester, Hans, uh, Hans Martin Schenke, uh, and many others about the authenticity of this. And Hans Dieter Betz, who did the final English translation of the Greek magical Pyre, who I knew in, at Harvard, says, it's my opinion Smith's book and the text he discovered should be carefully and seriously studied. Uh, and uh, by the way, these seven veils are the seven Merkaba heavens through, whom, through which one ascends. So we're going to look at some of this. So the Gospel of Thomas is a collection of 114, as they appear, they're logia, not devarim, attributed to Jesus. Uh, they're not discourses, but short sayings or allegorical parables. Many of them are independent variants of authentic Aramaic davarim and mashlim preserved in the synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, called synoptic because synoptic they take the same view. Uh, Matthew and Luke used Mark to compose their Gospels. Mark was the earliest, and then they had special material that they used. And unlike these synoptic materials, which are composed in Greek, most of the sayings in Thomas show evidence of Semitic language, idioms, construction, and other Aramaisms. So we know they came from an Aramaic dictation. Chaldean, or Aramaic, was a language spoken by Yeshua and his disciples. This was the alphabet used. It's the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, but it became written in Syriac script a, a century or two later. This is what it looks like. It looks sort of like Arabic. And that was a script into which the uh, Diatessaron, the second century Aramaic version of the New Testament was written. It was translated from the Greek New Testament into Aramaic, but it helps us very much. I've used it a lot to understand what the Greek and Aramaic equivalences were. Now Thomas uh, looks like this. This is Coptic. This is a Coptic alphabet is a is a combination of uh, uh, it, it's it's made of demotic characters which are <laughs> developed from um, from Egyptian hieroglyphs originally, and uh, and Greek large uncial letters. More half the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas, or about seventy nine of them, are paralleled in the canonic Gospels. Uh, 46 are in what's called Q, which is the source, common source material for Matthew and Luke, which we no longer have. It's, it's disappeared, but we can reconstruct it from Matthew and Luke. And 27 sayings are from Mark, and 12 are from the special Matthean source that he used to compose his, and one from the special Lucan source. But most of them have been altered by the redactor or the editor. Of, uh, to reflect Gnostic views and doctrines of the second and third century, just was, as was done in the New Testament Gospels, which when they redacted or took the, the bare sayings of Yeshua, which existed just as sayings, and they had no context, they had no one that you could see they were directed toward or against, and then they gave them a whole narrative frame, and they're different in Luke. Luke tells a story of a sermon on a plain, and Mark tells the same kind of a story of a sermon on a mount with little different materials and so on. And many of these uh, sayings in Thomas echo Johannine teachings from the Gospel of John, which is not a synoptic gospel, it's a separate tradition. It's very late, but it has some very important things in it. And the sayings found in Thomas are also quoted by church fathers and appear in the Gospel of Philip, many of them, which is another Gnostic document. And if you want an inline, uh, online introduction, there's a good one by uh, Mellon Smith at this, uh, at this address. <clears throat> uh, 
The language of Thomas, uh, well, this is, re this is re re recovered and restored from uh, manuscripts at Nag Hammadi, way up the Nile River in uh, 1945. Uh, <coughs> they were discovered by a little uh, little boy, and he came and sold them to uh, uh, very cheaply to uh, Arabic uh, dealers in antiquities, and they then uh, charged uh, a whole lot of money to Western people interested in these things. And uh, this particular manuscript, the, the Codex that we have the Gospel of Thomas from, was bought from an Arabic antiquity dealer for the purpose of scholarly research by grant from the psychologist Carl Jung. So it's called the Jung Codex. <coughs> it's written in Coptic, which is late Egyptian language that uses a Greek alphabet like that. Uh, and Greek fragments of Thomas we find in a big garbage dump in Oxyrhynchus, which is outside of Alexandria, from around the year 200 of the Common Era. Uh, and previously nobody knew what it was. It was not identifiable. Uh, Thomas trans was translated, what we have, the Coptic version, was translated from an earlier Greek version. Because originally Thomas was, the Gospel of Thomas was composed in Greek using the a list of Greek sayings that have been translated from a, a uh, from a real person who is dictating it in Aramaic to a bilingual scribe back in about AD 40 or AD you know the, the Christian era 30 or 40 or something like that and what we have is similar to but not completely identical with the fragments from Oxyrhynchus so it was translated from really a different Greek version but Oxyrhynchus is, is very early there are wormholes, which we call lacuna, little lakes, that left a few blanks in the Coptic text and a whole lot of blanks in the Greek fragments. And scholars have tried to fill them by counting missing letter spaces and completing them. <coughs> and usually it's not too hard to do. <coughs> the original language from which it was dictated to a bilingual scribe by a disciple of Yeshua before the year 50 was Aramaic, which was the language of Yeshua. <coughs> 